Well, hello and welcome. It is the Nisha Jackson Show. We have a guest. I feel like I'm on the Brady Bunch all of a sudden. I look down. I see one guy. I look over this way. I see another <laughs> one. Hi, Mom. How you doing? Uh, before we get started, I want to remind you to please hit that subscribe button. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Also, share this video with your friends. This one is an important one. You don't want to miss it. Nisha, who is our guest I'm looking down at right now? Yes, Michael Collins is with us today. He is a thought leader and a specialist on sugar addiction. One of my favorite topics to talk about. We talk about sugar a lot, don't we, Rusty? Yes, a yeah. lot. We do talk about it a lot. <laughs> but Michael is the founder of sugaraddiction.com. That is a great domain name. And Quit Sugar Summit, as well as past chairman of the board and current board member of Addiction Institute. And he's actually been completely sugar-free for over 30 years. I don't even know how that's humanly possible. <laughs> and has worked closely with others to help them regain their lives, ravaged by this addiction product, a very addictive product. I, I can say that for sure. I come from a very long line of sugar holics, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Me too. True, true sugar holics. Uh, that, I, I often heard that when you come from people in your, you, you have people in your family that are sugar holics and alcoholics, that the addiction potential is magnified. So tell, tell me how all of this happened with you. I'm very curious. I'm very curious. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's uh, an honor, really. Um, you know, I, I got the podcast version. It probably brings up more questions than it answers. But, you know, I thought I grew up as a regular kid. I mean, I thought, I think we all think that. But when I look back on it, we literally had unfettered access to the sugar bowl. My mother thought sugar was love. And I'll tell you the story as to why. <laughs> I mean, we could put as much sugar on our uh, Cheerios or cornflakes as we wanted. She never said anything. So as a result, we were scraping out a half inch or a quarter inch of sugar with the milk at the bottom. Yes. And uh, the story is kind of sad. My mom, my grandmother died when she was just eight years old. So they had to move in with uh, her aunt, uh, my grandfather's sister and uh they owned the country store across the way the family did and so anytime she walked into the country store they just said give her the candy give her whatever she wants whatever she points to just give it to her and it was a wonderful gesture for someone who was you know had lost their mom at eight years old but she really started to believe and did i think till she died almost believe that sugar was love i mean we would bond with giant cookie batches every Saturday, and we were just covered up our entire childhood with sugar. And uh, it really, I mean, there's a great YouTube video on, uh, on Eric, with Eric Clapton on 60 Minutes talking about, and this is an integral part of the story. He's talking to Ed Bradley at 60 Minutes, and they say, he says, uh, Ed Bradley says, uh, they're sitting in his $7 million Antigua treatment center, and uh, Ed Bradley says, Eric, so this addiction thing, it started with heroin, right? And Eric Clapton says, no, Ed, it started with sugar. Uh, I, I would eat bread and butter and sugar sandwiches, when, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was five years old, just to change my state. Now, remember that because it takes like a podcast length arc to understand that part, that statement. Right. So fast forward, I get to run it into beer and booze and pot and everything else at 14 and 15. And I knew that changed my state. I knew beer changed my state. I was kind of shy and I could talk to girls. Uh, we would drink behind the high school, you know, called it liquid courage, whatever. Anyway, this is, that's a different podcast. Fast forward to 28 and I got sober. So when I was getting sober, I realized that I went right back to sugar. Now all this is in hindsight. I didn't see it at the time. And all the people that I'm working with or that I'm uh, hanging out with in recovery, they all, same thing. They're getting diabetes diagnosis. They're gaining 50 pounds in the first year. And I was a thin athletic guy. I had gained weight. And, and I mean, it was, I was using it the same way, literally. I mean, I would drink 16 ounce Mountain Dews, six or eight of them a day. I don't think I ate any real food, pasta, pizza, candy, ice cream. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. And so it took me a while. I read a book called Sugar Blues back in the day. Yes, that's a, that was a good book. Classic, right? Yes, and, very uh, much 
so for your audience, the Sugar Blues was written by a guy named William Duffy. And Duffy ended up being married to Gloria Swanson, the famous movie star, right? Mm -hmm. They met at a party and he's putting two lumps of sugar in his coffee. And she says, from behind, he doesn't, you know, he recognized the voice, but a, vo a voice says, I wouldn't have that stuff in my house, let alone my body. He, <laughs> he was already a famous author at the time. And so they get married and they promote it. Anyway, I just took it to heart. I really love the history lesson. And I believe that to this day that we can't figure out how we got as a society and as individuals in this mess mm -hmm. until we figure out of this mess, till we figure out how we got in it. And his story of uh, the English empire growing on the backs of slavery and, uh, you know, in 200 years just literally took over the world uh, with the money they made on that, uh, you know, that commodity. And so, I mean, El Chapo, the drug dealer wouldn't have anything on the, on the British empire. They, they had made <laughs> so much money for so long. And so... Anyway, uh, I somehow at the time uh, talked my wife at the time into having children with no sugar, no flour, no caffeine in the womb and until it lasted till they were about six years old. Right. Yeah. Rusty and I were trying to figure out how, how you did that. That's that's impressive because it's hard. It seems like sugar's in everything, right? Oh, it was and it was a it, nightmare. And it's hard to keep your children away from sugar because, you know, you can't control every place that they're getting it from. It's very difficult. It was difficult. I mean, we fought our own their own grandparents and the schools and the Montessori schools and the parents, friends. They just thought we were depriving them of some kind of gift or you know, something child children need. Yeah. Right. Anyway, I, I honestly, and this is another subject, but we can talk about it, but I, you know, kids don't go grocery shopping before they're five or six. <laughs> You're responsible for it. But anyway, um, the, the, the end of the, this thing is the kids always said I should write a book because obviously they grew up after we, they did have a little sugar on one birthday party at six, we regained our resolve. And, and for their whole childhood, they only had it once a month outside. They never had it inside the house. And uh, so I did. And about before that, I bought sugaraddiction.com about 12 years ago, the domain name. And I, and I started putting out the best information on the planet. And some people kind of took it and ran with it. But for the most part, it wasn't until I was kind of semi-retired four or five years ago that I started coaching and doing online groups and forums and that kind of stuff. And that's when it just took off. And so, what so, would you, so what would you say from a from a sugar standpoint? I want I want people to make sure that they, you know, um, can relate to what what you're saying is that. If people, if people know, I mean, most people know if they have a sugar, a sugar addiction or a sugar, a propensity for sugar, right? Most people yeah. know that. Yeah. So, so for people who already know that, how, how is it that you've been sugar free for 30 years? I mean, how, how did you going from a lot of sugar growing up and then yeah. other, other drugs, you know, like the gate, you like, you talk about the gateway into other drugs, mm -hmm. how, how how do you do that? I mean, how, what would somebody even start thinking about doing if they know they have a sugar problem? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, how I did it was not how I hope for other people. It took two years of on again, off again, on again, off again. The simple answer is a pro, what I call a, step, a protocol of step down uh, you quit the caffeine first because you're going to need the the sugar to get off the caffeine. You do the sugar second and the flour third because you need the flour to get off the sugar. So it's a step down. Uh -huh. um, but that's, and, a, lot and why, why that's the, a lot easier said than done. Why the caffeine? What's the tie between caffeine and sugar? Caffeine will jack your blood sugar. And the, the core part of it is the wired together, fired together in your nucleus accumbens, your brain reward chemicals, mm -hmm. chocolate and caffeine are tied together, coffee and caffeine are tied, you know, coffee and sugar are tied together. So like Pavlov's dogs, the, the, when you, you know, ingest, try to ingest, this happens a lot, people try and stick with black coffee uh, and try and quit sugar or whatever. They end up, this creates cravings. First, it starts to jack up your blood sugar. And then it's the literally the body saying to itself, when I got this drug before, I used to get sugar. There was a com combination of these two things. And so it, it keeps the cravings alive. 
we have to move completely away from the sweetness and the old memories, muscle memories, if you will, but more brain chemical reward memories is what it really is. Right. Uh, so until you, you know, you, you've eliminated this craving for sweet, you literally readjust your taste buds. After a while, carrots taste sweet and peppers taste sweet. Okay, well, I got it. I got to interrupt now. Okay. Now, <laughs> now you're getting me here. Okay. So here's my, here's my question. And that is, first of all, I mean, you're talking about these things like they're addictive. Wouldn't the government stop those things? Number one. And number two, don't we need a little energy, a little caffeine, a little sugar? It's good for us, right? Just a little bit. Come on. <laughs> no, I appreciate that because I get it all the time. It's not a problem. I, I, look, we. Uh, one of my mentors says we are in the first five or six years of a tectonic shift in society. Okay. And you heard the term the right side of history. Well, the right side of history means that when science declared that seatbelts were would help save lives, many, many people resisted. When condoms in bathrooms were not accepted, condoms in general were not accepted. When smoking, when doctors used to advertise it on television, when drinking and driving was just a kind of a pat on the head, don't, you know, don't get caught kind of thing, these scientific uh, revelations and, and history prove to us that, you know, sugar and all its things is the science behind it has exploded in the last five years. If you're plugged into where, you know, where I sit and you could listen to just five minutes on my inbox, five minutes on my instant messenger, you would feel the pain out there of people who have struggled for 20 and 30 years That's trying to get off this stuff. And I started with late stage food addicts, people who were um, uh, two and 300 pounds overweight, losing limbs, going blind, and they still couldn't quit the sugar when the doctor said, you will die this year if you don't quit. And I think that, you know, the idea that finally for the first time, uh, medical science has said, and even in the pyramid, the only thing that changed in the, in the food pyramid that just came out this year, last year, is that sh children should not have uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. And so the science is moving in this direction. Right. And, and that's why it's a, it's a tough societal shift. And I get it. it, it it's understandable, but it's, it's very real. And, 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 I, and I know, like I said, it takes about a podcast setup for me to kind of get the whole arc of, of why I'm so passionate about this. Right. And, you know, I think one of the things that, that, and I, this has happened to me too, because uh, I can't, I can't have sugar in my house because if it's in my house, I'm going to eat it. I'm going to find it and I'm going to eat it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just know that about myself. So I don't, I don't have it in my house unless it's a, an occasion that I, I, whatever, it's a birthday party or whatever, but uh, I just can't trust myself. But one of the things is that that often keep people going back to it is that they get so sick when they go off of it. They feel like they have the flu. They feel depressed. And so one of the things that, that we like to do in our office when we take them off of it is replace some of the brain chemicals with amino acids that help bring up the serotonin, bring up the dopamine, because that's part of what they're getting with sugar is they're getting, they're getting a hit from it, right? 100%. So uh, certainly 100%. the depression, the, the depression is very much connected and then teaching them how to eat right, how to eat more lean proteins, how to get good, good types of fat in your diet. So you can nourish your system and nourish your brain and not be so depressed when you get off of the sugar. Cause you're right. It, they do feel better after they almost feel worse initially, depending on the, um, the state of their addiction. So oh, you're, you're hundred percent right. A good friend of, of Julia Robert or Julia Ross. I mean, she, she's on been on our summit many times and her work. Awesome. With, yeah. Her work with amino acids is, you know, I think under underutilized in a lot of ways, it's a very important part of the, uh, I think some of the, some people's pro we were actually working on that protocol now. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that the, the, descri the uh, description of the addiction or the withdrawals that you were describing are what people go through and the reason that they turn back because they're busy. They're, you know, they got kids, they got a job. They don't have time to be depressed, to have headaches, to be hungry, uh, to be lethargic, to be, um, you know, detoxing, have skin breakouts. They don't have time for all this. 
And one of the things that happens is in the fifth or sixth day when it's really nasty is they'll take a little bit of sugar and they'll realize all those symptoms go right away. And so almost unconsciously, they go right back to it um, as a, you know, it's been their go-to right. since they were children as an emotional management tool. Right. This is the important part of our work and the important message that I'd like to get out is that, you know, think about it when you were a kid, like what Eric Clapton was saying is like, uh, you were crying and hurt and upset and mean and ma mad or angry or whatever. And your mom didn't have time a couple of times and she would just give you a cookie and point you to the TV. And over time, we learn to literally use, um, I always talk about the, we use sugar to uh, assuage or, or, or to make, make us feel better. I mean, when was the last time you saw a, a movie where a woman got dumped by her boyfriend and didn't have an ice cream party? I mean, this is a, a real true thing, <laughs> right? And, and it's like, uh, I always talk about the proverbial person who lost 100 or 200 pounds who and kept it off for a long time. They don't talk anything about the food. They don't talk anything about the exercise. What they talk about is their emotional rejiggering, their emotional maturity. You know, it's a very common construct in the world of alcohol and drug addiction recovery that if you start using alcohol and drugs at 14 or 15 you stop growing emotionally your life's a mess your relationships are a mess your finances are a mess your career is a mess <clears throat> and when you talk to people who have recovered from uh, late stage or any kind of sugar addiction or flour addiction that's exactly what they talk about they right. come to realize that they were using it as an emotional management tool their system right. of emotional management was completely run by a substance. And look, it's unconscious because in society, there's so much of it and it's almost free. You can always score a little bit. And I know this sounds, uh, uh, Rusty's going, I know this sounds awful druggy, but it's so true when you talk to the people who have been through it. And even the people who don't have gigantic 100 pounds overweight habits, the folks that were, I've got ultra marathon as an, even an Olympic athlete, who had the same issues going through it and had to recover in the same way. Uh, they had to stop using these products to manage their emotions. They had to find other outlets, yoga, walking, massage, you know, any kind of self-care that might take some, um, some effort to get a dopamine hit, right? Yes. When your brain is looking for sugar and it's craving, it's not looking for a sweet taste. What it's looking for is a dopamine hit. Right. And this is the science that's exploded in the last five years. Mm -hmm. So you talk about, uh, you know, the seven day, the 12, the 14 day, the 21 day. You talk about, you know, how long does it take to kind of get through these periods of we'll call we'll call them detox. Yeah, I, I've, I've often told patients that just said, I don't even know where to start. I have always said whether it's right or wrong. I've always said if you could just make it three days, 72 hours without sugar, your 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 need for it will already be substantially less mm. so and it's so interesting people will come in and they'll say i think i have arthritis my my knuckles are swollen my joints hurt my body hurts and I, and and i'll and i'll usually say that like we're going to test you see what's going on but try 72 hours with no sugar and flour and just see what just see what happens with your arthritic hands mm. i telling you most of the time they call back and say i don't think i have arthritis yep. so it, the, the whole inflammatory thing is fascinating to me, um, and 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 it shouldn't be too surprising for people today. But te let's talk a little bit about the seven day, fourteen day, twenty one day. Can, can I ask one quick question before you get into that because it's important? Because you've you've both mentioned sugar and flour. Mm. What yes. does flour have to do with anything? Yes. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. No, I kind of sneak that in on the podcast, but I don't talk about it as I move into my programs because they don't want to know it. They don't, people don't want to be giving up both at the same time. But flour turns to sugar in your stomach, basically, right? Almost immediately. It has such a huge surface area. Uh, it, you know, it's digested so rapidly. It jacks your, it jacks your uh, blood sugar and it, you know, keep, cre keeps the cravings alive. Um, I call it powder addiction. Uh, anything that's been reduced to a white powder, I think is, uh, is a problem. And we've been, you know, genius is only pattern recognition. We've been blessed to be able to see thousands of detoxes over and over. And people that try and stay on the caffeine and the, and the flour, 
thinking it's just the sugar, they usually, uh, you know, they just yo-yo up back and forth, back and forth. So yeah, flour is a big part of it. It really is. Um, as far as the hands and the knees and the detox, everything is always hands and knees, hands and knees. People's hands clear up, their knees clear up. A lot of people, one person had a, uh, had already had one knee replacement and was getting scheduled for the other one and, and put it off because she didn't need it. And, uh, and, and that happens in the hands and the, and the carpal tunnel and the whole thing. But what I describe when I talk about three day, seven day, 14 day, this is, these are all uh, detoxes that are out there from some famous people. Right. But most, most of them have bolted it on to some fitness or uh, food plan. Uh -huh. uh, they they've just kind of, it's all the rage. So they're adding it on. And what it does is three days is just not enough. I know I had to break your <laughs> bust your bubble, but three <laughs> days is right <laughs> is right in the middle of the detox. That is the <laughs> worst worst time. Oh. That if it, they, you know, I mean, there's great harm reduction. And I'll talk about harm reduction in a second. But yes, um, if you go 14 days, if you if you don't integrate what I've been describing about the emotional rejiggering, the emotional management system being redone in the first 30 days, 60 days, then you're doomed to repeat it. And what happens out there, and you've seen the studies, this is like, like scientific lore. Literally, there's hundreds of peer-reviewed studies that say if someone, and there's actually a P CDC study on the biggest loser, that if, if people lose substantial amounts of weight, they always gain it back in the first year. And obviously any diet book worth the paper it's printed on says, quit the white stuff, flour and sugar. So people white knuckle and they exercise and they, they get off the white stuff for 14 days, 30 days, whatever. But if they don't integrate into this recovery plan, a substitute for the emotional management then they end up repeating it. And this is what 95, and this is the studies are out there. 95% of people not only gain all the weight back, but then they add some. And even people with bariatric surgery figure out ways to ingest sugar, liquid sugar, and they, they you know, it, it ruins their, their operation and stuff. This is also very common knowledge and, and very scientifically proven. So it's if they don't do the emotional management learning, if they don't get it in the early days and begin a substitute, right. then they're bound to repeat it. Yeah, I totally agree. And starting from a young child, I mean, I agree. You know, even though we, you and I, when we grew up, all three of us having, you know, un unsweetened cereal, but then putting teaspoons of sugar on it. If you mm. look at how many teaspoons are in some of the sugars today, it's more than what we were using. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Even though we still had a lot of that sugar at the bottom of the bowl, which, by the way, mixed with milk was pretty darn good. Tasty, right? <laughs> I love that stuff. Pretty good. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get to the bottom. Right. Yeah. And think about it. It's like you use up your entire daily allotment of dopamine in like 20 minutes. And then you're like chasing that high again for the rest of the day. And it's this science in the last five years that has kind of fleshed out this our ability to succeed so well with so many people is yes. that now we get it. We understand that we are literally, now look, we do a little bit of heroin. We do a little bit of alcohol. We do a little bit of cocaine, but we are pounding 21 teaspoons a day through this system, probably since we were children. And if you have any habit at all, a Coke is 12 uh, teaspoons of sugar you're probably doing 30 or 40 teaspoons, this is before flour, teaspoons of sugar through your body. You are never not manually manipulating your dopamine. No right. wonder when you right. quit for 12 days, you're depressed a little bit because now what it's called scientifically is down-regulated. Your, uh, re your dopamine receptors are down-regulated, thinned out. You have less of them, right? And so when you finally stop, your body goes, and you're not going to be able to get, you're not even going to get what we do as adults when you're using sugar, flour, or caffeine. You're not trying to get any buzz. All you're trying to do is get back to even. You just don't want to go into withdrawals. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Is fruit out too? Oh, you're going to hate me. You're going to hate me. This is going to, this is where I get I hate you already. Time. So it doesn't matter how much you <laughs> We're going to, it's okay. I, I'm, I'm very used to it. So the fruit thing is a big one, especially in the early days, as I described the, uh, you know, the readjustment to the, 
I call it the, the uh, original operating software, the original operating software of the body. So look at fruit, okay? Uh, 300 years ago, fruit was uh, these little crab apples or those nasty little berries you see. And once a year, if you want to get risk getting stung by it, be a little bit of honey. That's how much fructose we used to eat, okay? Now, important lesson, important part of the process. The, the table sugar molecule is half fructose and half glucose, right, for your listeners. And people have always worried and thought about or concentrated upon the glucose part of it, where it causes diabetes, causes heart disease, causes everything you can think of under the sun, metabolic stuff, you know, metabolic illness, right? What has exploded in the last five years is the understanding of fructose, okay? So fructose, forget about powdered fructose, that's even like the difference between coca leaves and cocaine. I mean, but look, the fructose is the offending molecule. This is what's acting on the nucleus accumbens. This is what only can be processed in the liver, okay? There's no other way that the fructose can be processed. It has to go through the liver. So we have a epidemic of five-year-old with, with fatty liver disease. This okay. is an alcoholic's disease that five-year-olds are now getting because of the massive amounts of fructose. Right. So back to the fruit a second. Look at navel oranges, look at seedless grapes. These things are hybridized fructose bombs. They don't even, they couldn't replicate in nature because they have no seeds, right? And so when you begin the process of detoxing from sugar, you're gonna very easily keep the nucleus accumbens going uh, by adding this fructose, this continuous fructose hit. And if you were to drink a, like a dried fruit, forget about it, fruit juice, forget about it, For a, a, a glass of organic orange juice will hit the liver with the same pounding of fructose that a Coca-Cola will. And so it's no different. And the fruit will just keep you, uh, the cravings alive. The fructose hit to the brain will just keep the cravings alive. Right. So yeah, it's a it's a big one. I get a lot of pushback on it. And you're not okay, alone yeah. there, Rusty. Yeah. yeah. So you, we just have a few minutes left, Michael. I want I want to make sure that our guests hear about the summit and some of the other things. I mean, is this a place where they could go to your website and get more information about? Because I'm I think the emotional part's really important to talk about. I, I'm glad that you weaved that in several times during the show. Yeah. Dealing with that emotional component and and what is the trigger emotionally that you're satisfying when you're eating the sugar, as opposed to just trying to go hardcore, no sugar, like maybe yeah. that should be evaluated, right? So, yes. so yes. How, how can we tell our guests about what they could do if they want to understand that more? Yeah, just sugaraddiction.com. If you want, you can just, there's a big yellow book there. You just click on the book and you can download it for free. Um, it tells the story of, of it, all the stuff that we're talking about a little bit more in depth. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that you mentioned the Quit Sugar Summit. We've been doing it for five, six years now. We're going to have our seventh event in September. So if you just go there and leave your email, you'll, you'll, you'll get notified. But you can see all of the experts. We actually had Judy Collins, the famous singer on, and Dr. Lustig, and Gary Tobbs, and Dr. Fecky, and Dr. Noakes. I mean, all of the biggest sugar educators in the world uh -huh. uh, are there. Uh, and we have them, most of them every year because their people love them so much, but we have new people every year as well. Mm -hmm. And this is where I've, you know, the science has been, you know, trumping the, the cultural history, right? The 300 years of evolution of sugar into our diet so deeply. And it's a big battleship to turn around and the summit does a lot to, uh, help people, motivate them to understand. Most people, when they come, they come for weight loss, but they also come because they don't want to repeat what maybe happened to their parents, which is dementia, or they're calling Alzheimer's three, um, yes. and, uh, you know, diabetes and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, thank you. It's a uh, I always tell folks, if they get to sugaraddiction.com, we got a quiz there, and you watch something like this, you don't really need to take the quiz, just grab the book. 
just grab the book. <laughs> well, I appreciate your information to to everybody because this is a worldwide epidemic for sure. Trans transcends every segment of the population, and it's a it's a hot topic. And I love educating people about this because it really it really does affect everybody. Yeah. Um, and I think it's led to our um, our massive use of alcohol now um, and very accepted uh, socially um, use of just now the I call it the liquid sugar, too. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, and the and the coffee drinks for sure. So it was really nice having you. What, what if, if you in leaving what what's just one tip or one piece of hope you could give to our audience about uh, trying to um, recover from being a sugar holic? Yeah, what we found, it's interesting that in just kind of surveys and just knowing everybody is that the folks that resonate with like a, a podcast like this, or uh, if they've done their research, a lot of them are pioneers. They're, they're the first in their family to go to college. I mean, you go back to their history. They're the leader of the sewing circle. They're what they're, 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 they've done well in their career in academics and athletics. They, they're not afraid to go against the grain and to you know join a new tribe, a tribe who believes a little different, maybe than their family of origin. And so that's the if this is something that you find yourself as uh, relating to, or you're kind of a pioneer and not afraid to to step out and and, and do something good for yourself, then. Those are the kind of folks that I think uh, we're the early adopters, as they say in tech, you know, we're the folks that like 99.9% .9 of the people are going to have the questions just like Rusty. And they're going to be like, hey, that's crazy talk. You know, who is it? Who is this guy? Well, as the leader of the sewing club, I really appreciate you being here. He's Mike Collins. The website again is sugaraddiction.com, sugaraddiction.com. Nisha Jackson's website's out there too, nishajackson.com as well. And oh, Mike's book is The Last Resort Sugar Detox Guide, right? Yes, sir. And you can get it for free. Download, download it for download free it. at sugaraddiction.com. You got it. All right. You until next time, please, please hit that subscribe button. Share it. Uh, this is an important show. Make sure you share this with all your friends and your, your sugar addict friends, too. Until next time, she's Nisha Jackson, and this is the Nisha Jackson Show.